slow. It could be my internet. <laughs> I can't. I can't hear you. Oh, there you go. I can hear you now. <laughs> <laughs> he's, still, he's still laughing that's why um <laughs> great okay. minds great, great minds think alike so my ears are really my ears your ears warm my ears are really warm i find this is really snug on the ears yeah it's, it's making my head quite hot as well <laughs> This is honestly just just for the the millions of people that watch. We didn't plan this. It's actually genuinely what we uh, both <laughs> independently decided to wear. <laughs> oh hi, Alison. Hi, <laughs> welcome. Yeah, I should probably explain where we are because um, obviously, if if you've accidentally stumbled across across this broadcast, you're probably wondering what's going on with um, two middle-aged men with um, with bras on their heads. Um, this is a VHS Film Club. Um, <laughs> where um, both Guy and I are going to go back. It's not a DeLorean, because I don't own a DeLorean, but I do own a, a Polo from the 80s, but, and I've managed to fit a flux capacitor to it. So we both go back into the past, go to uh, our favourite or whatever video shop, um, and and decide to rent a movie. But, but we are back in the days where we were struggling artists, uh, not where we are now. We're obviously, you know, world famous and very rich now from our art. Um, so we've got to pick one video. That's all the money we've got to do. And we're going to do that. We're going to talk through the films and also get the audience as well to uh, to help us with that. But before we get into that, guys, do you want to just um, um, say a bit about you and what you do apart from wearing women's lingerie on your head? Yeah. Well, I'm a very serious um, writer of fiction, you know, as you can see um I, I don't know i don't know it's just, just this is messing with my head i just i can't think about anything else um <laughs> I, i've written two books both um sort of historical um fiction sort of thrillers one's more of a detective kind of thing set in the 20s called the mirror game um the other one's called the apprentice thief which is set a bit earlier in 1890s india um and um that that's the sort of thing today i'm working on another one at the moment um which is quite exciting but that's going to be set now um it doesn't feature anyone wearing lingerie on their heads it's very serious <laughs> <laughs> okay and 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 also i'm a fellow author um i i write in a genre called delusional fantasy um i pretty much i made that up so i could be number one in delusional fantasy which is going well so far until well, someone else joins yeah. the group um, first book was Shimmer. I think his pictures are too small, actually. First book was Shimmer, then Midas, then Lucas, which is a bit more horror. Um, but yeah, um, but that's not the main reason we're here. It's just incidental um, that we do this. Um, oh, by the way, Guy, if anything comes up on um, uh, captions, please let us know any comments. I, I think I'm getting them this time, but sometimes I don't. The last one I've got is from Sam. Um, but if there's any other ones, please jump in and let us know what the people are saying. Uh, yeah, I will. Well, Sam said, oh my God, you too. Um, yeah, okay, cool. We're say, on the same page. Then. Uh, okay. I wore this um, primarily. I was going to be um, Vernon Wells, but I thought it might yeah. just be a bit too scary. I'm, I'm already a little bit intimidating. So I thought, you know, soften up, guy. Don't scare people away this time, you know. Uh, and you've and, uh, the same. Yeah, and, and, and also I know you, your kids are going to probably need therapy in their teenage years yeah. based on, you know, the outfits you've worn, putting them to bed in previous <laughs> so, so probably just as well not to have a scary one. Um, so, um, yeah, so like I said, with, you know, both very, 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 very successful authors. Um, you know, I think uh, from, from the latest book sales, I'm sure it's the same for Guy, but, you know, um, I, I actually commissioned a um, a group of the world's top chefs, including yep. Gordon Ramsay and, and some others, to gold leaf um, uh, some cornflakes individually, gold nice. leaf them, um, and then bathe them in a bath of uh, donkey milk, yep. which sounds completely wrong, but apparently donkey milk is the most expensive milk there is, but donkey milk doesn't sound like it comes out of a boob, to be honest. So I don't, although I spent like, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds on this bowl of cereal, I don't really fancy eating it now. 
Uh, <laughs> no. I don't know if you have any similar experiences, Guy. Um, I've had statues commissioned of myself um, and placed in every large city on the globe. Um, that wow. they're a minimum of a hundred foot high, you know, just me, you know, in a pose, sort of like that. And um, yeah, it's, it's going pretty well. You know, I think it's helping get my name out there. And um, yeah, you know, I couldn't be happier living the dream. Well, you're already a household name. It, it just means future generations will know about you too. So I think yeah. I think what you're doing is worthy. If you, if, if you hadn't done it, some uh, someone else would have done it. So it's good yeah. that you're funding it yourself and it's not come out of public yeah. funds. So, so good on you. <laughs> um, so I was thinking which video shop to go to. Um, I was thinking we could go to the video shop in Stranger Things, if you, unless you had a different uh, suggestion. No, that sounds good. I've never seen Stranger Things, so I'm all ears. Well, you know. Okay. Oh, there's a video shop in it, but it's based in the 80s. Oh, before we get into that, we need to make sure we've got snacks. We could have low blood sugar and fall over during this uh, during this broadcast. So, well, what, what did you what did you get, guy? Um, I've got a uh, fries Turkish delight. It is. Oh my god! I can promise. Have right. you got the same as well to to cut it in half? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll do that in a minute. I do actually have a sword somewhere. Um, so I'll have another glass of wine. I have a pop at slicing this bad boy in half. Um, well, what have you got wrong? <laughs> I've got some oh, sweet things. shake crisps. Wow, um, I haven't seen it for years. I, I probably will put more salt in. I, I did have some Kinder Surprise, but I don't know where they've gone. I think the kids might have taken them. Um, and um, I've got some foam bananas as well, which um, I absolutely love. And um, that's my ET snack. Okay, we could have been more critical. The kids could have nicked the bra. So, you know, yeah. picking just went. I don't know if I can show you this very well. Uh, oh, God, it popped out. <laughs> don't hear you when that happens. Um, but, <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> these are uh, raspberry pencils, the giant raspberry pencils. All right. Looks like something like Tremors, doesn't it? Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, and, and um, the reason. The reason they're blue is I've just come out of the kitchen, you know, in a, in the party at Wyatt's house, and everything in that kitchen is blue. So my <laughs> treats are blue, uh, my drink is blue, so everything is blue because you know obviously Lisa did a magic and everything is blue now. Oh, well Sam says foam shrimps. Yeah, I think I think they're a similar deal. Yeah, foam shrimps. Are. I haven't seen a foam yeah. shrimp in a while. They're the same. They're just a different colour. That, that's basically the difference. There you go. I'm, I'm glad we can clear up these technical differences. We've got experts here, people who lived and breathed the 80s. Yeah. Oh, it's getting a bit warm in here. <laughs> this is the longest I've been inside a bra for a very long time. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, so, so anyway, we better get into the meat of the show now. Um, so the first film we're trying to choose between is uh, Weird Science. Uh, we've gone Hughes versus Hughes. This is a teen yeah. film episode. Um, and when, when we kind of talked about the films, I completely forgot that John Hughes did both of these films, actually. But he was Mr. Teen of the 80s, wasn't yeah. he? But, okay, so I got... So this, this, is a, this is the cover. Um, so you can see Kelly DeBrock there. And um, know, which one's that? That's, that's Wyatt and Gary. She, she's um, so this is what we can see on the shelf. What's that? She's green in that. That's, uh... I know, I think... It's, I think it's a bad um, scan. <laughs> All right. Oh, fair enough. I wish you'd decide. You see, it's not a video. But um, anyway, that's the video. That's the cover of the video. Which um, you know, if, if people like Kelly and Brooke, that's gonna that's gonna pull people in. Yeah. Um, um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, give a synopsis of the film if, if someone's not seen it. Oh, oh, hang on. Oh, Alice, oh yeah. Let's see what people have got at home as well. So addison has got on. white mice and purple hearts. Alison, that's not what you told me earlier. Earlier, you told me you, you had two 14-inch sausage rolls that you were you were looking to as your as your snacks for this. Is it this? The white mice and purple hearts must be must be dessert. I think. You already had the sausage rolls. Yeah, there was there was a there was a lot of sausage meat to handle. I, I don't think I could handle that amount of sausage meat, to be perfectly honest. But yeah, two fourteen inches. Yeah, they they looked amazing. Like the sandworms from June when I saw them. That was the first thing I kind of thought. <laughs> okay, so I don't know what Sam's saying two fourteen inches is a good choice, or whether she means the um, the white mice and 
Oh, flying saucers, yeah. But well, if Sam's got some flying saucers, that's great. They, they were great as well. A bit of sherbet. I never got those things. Were they, were they like made of paper? Because you like chewed through that stuff. It's like almost yeah. like cardboard. Like they found a use for cardboard. You know, we'll put it in sweets. Kids will just eat it, especially in the eighties. And then yeah, a bit of sort of like hair inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, okay. So what I was going to do, I was give the synopsis, but I thought actually a quote from the film would be better for this because actually. Uh, rice paper, oh, they rice paper. There you go. Again. We've got more technical thing here on the on the speak to the eighties. Maybe that's a different show. Um, so I'm going to do this as Wyatt, I think, when he's explaining to Chet what's happened to the house. Um, so I'm going to do. I thought it would be a better way to give a synopsis. So he go. So he says, "Go along, we're missing a boat on the computer on Friday night. We decided to make a woman. She did, and she went crazy. She messed up the whole house." So I think that says it all, really. That's the film. <laughs> That's the film. Okay, Alison's confirmed she does have the 14 inch sausage as well. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, I, I have to say, it's a colossal sausage, but you didn't just say you had one, you said you had two. So, you know, you know, yeah, end to end, that's 28 inches of sausage roll. It's a lot of, <laughs> inches of sausage. It's a lot of milk. Anyway, I'm, getting, I'm getting distracted. I'm getting distracted. Um, no sequels for this one. Um, although there was a Weird Science TV show uh, which followed. Um, oh, yes, Sam loves Weird Time, which I actually really enjoyed. Uh, Vanessa Angel, who was um, the, the main female character in Kingpin, the Farrelly Brothers film, she was Lisa in it. I can't remember who the uh, Gary and Wyatt were. It was actually really good. I, I remember there's some really good episodes. There's a really good episode where I think they got hold of this, because there's a lot of magic and stuff, isn't there? That um, they, One of them, I can't remember if it was Gary. It must have been Gary. It must have been Gary. Gary had this magic remote control. And basically, he could fast forward time. So what he was doing was, is, is my head overheating? Yes, both of us. Is, yeah, if we put, really can we, yeah, can we have a safety message before we move on? So if you see either me <laughs> or my co-host, like, keel over to the side, uh, or guy, coach, keel over, could someone please call an ambience, please? Because that, that is a real risk. You know, yeah. no, no one has done this before. So Nothing. I'm not for it, not since the 80s anyway. Anyway, yeah, there was this. <laughs> remote control episode so gary was going on dates but he didn't really care about the date bit he just wanted to get to the kissing at the end so he was fast forwarding the date with this remote control so he could just get to the kissing bit but then on the other side wyatt his life because he was kind of in the same time loop his life would go on fast forward at the same time so he would do things like start sitting in an exam and he'd sit down with the pen and then gary would hit the fast forward and then the whole the whole exam would go past and, and Wyatt hadn't written a thing. So Wyatt's life was an absolute nightmare because Gary was just trying to get to the end of the day so he could get to the kissy kissy bit. But it was a really good series. I really enjoyed it actually, but there was no sequel, no no, no TV, no um, film sequel. Um, it was 15. Um, it costs 8 million to make, which kind of makes sense. There's quite a lot of special effects. Well, I couldn't find out what I really wanted to find out. I wanted to find out how much the um, computer effects were. Yeah. Because they're really yeah. rudimentary, but I bet at the time they were cutting yeah. edge, and I bet they cost a fortune. But I couldn't find that out, unfortunately. But if someone if someone does know, if they find out, please, I'd love to know. Um, so it cost eight million, and it made thirty eight million. So globally, so modest, and I think it I probably had more of a following actually on video and TV afterwards. Actually, probably one of those ones that did uh, better there. Um, who's in it? We got Anthony Michael Hall as uh, as as Gary. So one of the teenage losers. Um, people rem might remember him from American Vacation. Uh, he's, oh, I can't remember his name on American Vacation. Rudy. Rudy in American Vacation in the first one. Um, and they've, um, they've got Elon Mitchell Smith as uh, Wyatt. And I can't really notice any film that I've ever seen with him in again, to be perfectly honest. But he's great in this film. Uh, Kelly LeBrock, um, who is Lisa, um, who's known for The Woman in Red with Gene Wilder as well. Don't really know from any other films either. Uh, the late great Bill Paxton. Very sad that Bill Paxton's not with us anymore. Who's an amazing actor? He was Hudson in Aliens. If everyone remembers, Game Over, man, Game Over. You know that guy, the guy who probably acted in that film. Like, I guess, like we'd all hope we would do. You know, we'd be like basically filling our pants, but at the same time, be have enough to be able to try and at least you know, sort of do the brave thing, but still be absolutely pooing our pants. So I, I love him in that film. Um, 
Mighty Joe Young he was in. So he actually got, I think he went from being a bit part, a bit actor, a bit like, um, he actually did the thing probably that um, Carl Weathers never managed to do. He went from being kind of like a bit part player in films or a co-star to actually being the star. And he did that in Mighty Joe Young and he did it in Twister as well. So yeah, yeah. really, really pleased with yeah. him because he's a great actor. Um, uh, Robert Downey Jr., really early role for him, Mr. Tony Stark. Um, he's also in a film which got forgotten, which was brilliant, um, called In Dreams. And that was just before he went to prison. It was a brilliant film, that is. I, I remember that film. I think it's, I think it's very much... Um, kind of a psychosis kind of film where you're not really sure what's going on um, and obviously I relate I relate to that kind of yeah, stuff yeah. really well um, so he's kind of a bully in it there's another guy called Robert Russell who's the other bully um, he's in a film I love as well called Vamp with Grace Jones um, yeah, and there's yeah, kind yeah. of a, a whole club full of vampires and they're kind of college kids so he's in it too um, Susan Snyder is one of the love interests called Deb I didn't think I'd seen anything that she'd been in, but I have seen Killer Clowns from Outer Space, which is probably one of the worst films I've ever seen. I don't think that'll ever make it onto Film Club. But she's also in The Last Starfighter as well, which is a great film. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, know, I mean, remember, you know, the kid with the arcade, and then he get, you know, he does well in the arcade, and he gets um, recruited to be, you know, one of the, you know, the the um, galaxy's defenders. Oh, um, like this, that, yeah. there's a. The guy I think you might know more about, I don't know if he's got a music background, maybe a jazz background, is, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, is it Chino Fats Williams? Um, so he, he, he was both in Roadhouse and in Action Jackson. He was, in Action Jackson, he was the guy who ran the hotel. So a black voice. guy, really deep voice yeah. with, a, with a cigar. I don't know if he has got a jazz background or not, but he, he almost sounds like he should have one. Certainly so. Sounds like he should have. Well, it's not a deep voice, is it? It sounds like he's probably had some really something seriously wrong with his throat, because um, it's like eh, it sort of talks like that, doesn't he? But he, he he was a great character. Yeah, I'm not sure if he has. He certainly should have, and and I would make him an honorary blues man if he didn't. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it might be the tobacco actually. I think it was the heavy smoking actually probably gave him the rasp. But a really really distinctive voice. Yeah, but, um, he was in it. Um, there's a bit of a bit character called what um, called uh, a guy called Wallace Langham. He was Art. I think he was supposed to have a bigger role in the film. I think he was supposed to be in a, a group of friends called the Weenies. Um, but he was one of the people who get stuck in the TV. Uh, but he was in a film uh, called Combat Academy, which I also liked. Um, I think it was one of those films that didn't really do big, but was was a good film. Um, and then the last two were cool. So there's Michael Berryman which most people wouldn't know his name, but would really recognise his face. Really distinctive looking guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. He's in the hills of eyes, over, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Um, yeah, yeah, he was one of the mutant bikers that trashed the house. And then the last one, which is, I really thought I was going to see you turn up as this guy, uh, Vernon Wells. And again, people's name probably don't remember. Australian actor, as far as I'm aware. He was um, in Mad Max too. He was one of the uh, main main kind of bad guys in that he had like a adamant uh, white stripe across his nose mohawk uh, and he pretty much in this film dressed exactly as he did in mad max too that was the idea wasn't it to have a scary person he was also in commando as well he's also the yeah. the main bad guy in commando um i remember he had a really dodgy tash in that film yeah. um in, but, in the space but yeah. he was in as well wasn't he that's another was one he in space? Was, he was he in that yeah he wow. was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it in the space the Dennis Quaid one? Yeah, mm -hmm. he had um he was another bad guy, but he had like a hand that had all kinds of different tools. Um Ooh. and then he ends up going in the suit going after him. Um ah, okay. Yeah, it, a it, we should do that one too. But yeah, he, he was great. Yeah, he was um such a cool actor. He said it was his first time doing this film that he'd been to America apparently. Oh, okay, that makes sense because yeah, Australian actor Mad Max was filmed in Australia, so that makes probably that makes total sense. Was there anyone else in there that you noted? Um, there was a kind of the actors I kind of um, kind of knew from other films. I think you nailed all the major ones. Let me just have a quick um, Robert Rutler. Uh, um, I think we've nailed all the same ones actually. I'm just having a quick look through William. Gay. To do with the burgers as far as I know. Nothing Sorry. To do with Russell burgers. He's nothing to do with the microwave burgers, as far as I know, Robert Russell. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them. Um, I've got uh, Michael Robbins. Yeah, the, the, no, nobody with a sort of interesting. Um, there's a few people. 
John Kapalos, who played Dino. Um, he he was the, there's a few that John Hughes like like to use I think um, and yeah. that that sort of reappear throughout his films, which is mm-hmm. kind of cool, you know. Um, nice. He's one of them. Um, I don't John Asher, but I don't know him. But um, but they I think they were ones that did kind of crop up from time to time in other films, which is kind of cool when directors do that. They, it's like a bit of a sort of a um, like a theatre company, you know. And I, I really like yeah. that. Um, yeah. But I love John Berryman in it. He's only got a really small part. I don't think he says anything. Um, but he's he really does, he he's, he's still going he's now. Brilliant. I think he's in his eighties now. Um, but he, <laughs> but he's always like cast well because of his distinctive looks. Um, he's he's made a career doing that. It's awesome. Well, he definitely says something because when they when they kind of like see when Gary and Wyatt see him off, you know. You know, when they see him off, um, then uh, there is a bit where Michael Berryman does speak, and he, he said, "I think he says, can we keep this between us? Because I'd hate to lose my my teaching job.'" And he, he says, "In a really, you know, he comes in really scary, and he he, he couldn't do any better middle class kind of accent type thing, you know." So, <laughs> brilliant. This is one of the cool bits. Um, as probably everyone knows, written and directed by John Hughes. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to list a few of the films I really like by John Hughes. I know he's done a lot more, but some of them I actually like a lot more than others. Uncle Buck, yeah. which I think is an awesome film with John Candy. Plane, Trains and Automobiles, again with John Candy. Uh, amazing film. And and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which we're going to get to get to in a minute. Um, songs. Um, we covered this in the last one, but uh, I think there were some good songs here. I love the Weird Science song in this song in this film. Yeah, Weird Science. Doo, doo, yeah, I've, I've, I've been having that for ages, and it did make a a, rep- a pr- reprisal. That's the wrong word, isn't it? it it's come up again in um, in the Bumblebee Transformer film as well. I think Bumblebee plays Weird Science as well oh, at one point on the right. video as well, which is cool. Um, it was actually performed by someone um, called Oingo Boingo. Which, um, yeah. And they did a song in, in the Donnie Darko film as well, which I, I don't remember. But interestingly, it was produced by Danny Elfman yeah. as well. You know, Danny Elfman became huge, especially when he kind of got on board with um, uh, Tim Burton. He became massive. So obviously, he's obviously doing his craft here because this is obviously before um, before Beetlejuice. So I thought it was interesting. Um, he was in that band, Oingo Boingo. Obviously, oh, no, yeah. that's, 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 yeah. ah, there you go. This, yeah, he's like the lead singer or something. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I always defer you. Yeah, um, Guy's knowledge on music is vastly greater than my own. Um, <laughs> that's brilliant. Okay, that, that's the connection there. Um, obviously, this was a, actually a comedy, kind of comedy sci-fi, really, wasn't it? Yeah. So there's, there's some special effects in this. Um, I think, yeah, um, the bit with the, the missile, was immense. So obviously, yep. no. There was, I'd say there's no computer effects. There's a little bit. It was obviously a computer, but no um, CGI. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, I'm just before I go on to that, Alison said '80s by Killing Joke, classic oh, song. Right. Okay. I've heard of as well. There's also a Batman comic called The Killing Joke as well, isn't there? But um, I'll have to look back at that. It's a good soundtrack, though. I think the whole the way through, um, there are some really good music. Weird Science is the lead one, but there are some other good ones. I think when um, where they try and actually when they create the missile is a really good song. I don't know if it's that one, um, but um, it could be. It could be when they do, when they kind of make the stuff. But yeah, that missile was amazing. That was all a physical effect missile going through the house. Yeah. Um, and I did and I did read that the first time they did that that they did that shot, um, it actually got cocked up because uh, Anthony Michael Hall farted <laughs> during that time, which sent the cast into into laughing. Which completely ruined the take, and allegedly um, that special effect cost a hundred thousand pounds. So that one, you know, one cheek sneak cost a hundred thousand pounds, <laughs> which, which is great. Which is obviously the kind of things we can do because we're such we're rolling in so much cash. I think we can afford a hundred thousand pound yeah. fart. Yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, and, and the Chet monster. Well, I think we'll come back to the Chet monster again. But I love, you know, the the monster that Lisa turns Chet into. I think that's absolutely awesome. What was was there anything else in the film? Any special effects that you had in the film that you thought were great? I, I, I like the computer, the stuff in the beginning. Oh, hi, Pauline. Um, 
all, all, all the sort of computer stuff and when they're sort of making it is kind of brilliant. Um, the exploding door um, that sort of explodes. That's quite a popular thing. I've seen that quite a few 80s films, a sort of exploding door and then someone walks through it. It seems to be quite a popular uh, kind of occurrence. Um, I, don't, I, I liked um, the lightning around the house. There's also a phase where they were trying to mix like cartoon stuff because um, it was before CGI. Um, yeah. They do it on Highlander as well. So they're trying to kind of make the most realistic cartoon possible and do like all the lightning stuff. Uh, and I love that because that, that, that sort of typifies the 80s for me, like seeing that kind of stuff. Um, it just takes me straight back. I think it's awesome. Um, but yeah, the lightning was cool. Um, I quite liked the um, when everything gets a bit crazy when they try it for the second time, um, only they forget to hook up the doll. Um, and then everything goes nuts. So all the stuff gets sucked out the chimney. Um, and the, so, <laughs> that girl, it was someone fairly well known in the camera, I can't remember who it was, but she's playing the piano and the piano disappears and then she's hanging on and then, then she's sort of suddenly in her underwear because obviously that would happen, wouldn't it? Um, we've all been there. Um, and, and everything <laughs> comes sort of flying out the chimney. Yeah, this, um, this is where this part came from, you yeah, know, one of those parties. So, you yeah, just, you know, <laughs> when someone gets sucked at the chimney, and they lose all their clothes, then obviously there's um, there's, there's bras left lying around. I mean, this <laughs> happens to me all the time, you know. It's just like, and then the, yeah, the piano, and then it all goes back in. They just sort of reverse it. It all goes back in. It's great that stuff. And I think there was one where the other one I really liked was when they're in a room, and then it's all, all sort of upside down, and they're, oh, they're so grand, yeah. Uh, that, that must yeah. be quite hard to film because obviously like a revolving set. That must have been quite tricky to actually navigate that. Okay. It's still a fact. They would have physically spun that room, basically. Yeah. So that is pretty. That is pretty impressive. I have to agree with Alison. I think it's a great score. Um, we'll get we'll get onto the comedy in a minute. I think. Uh, have oh, you got some? I think Sam Sam's saying that she's been um, sucked through a few chimneys in her time. Um, oh, really? Because it's, 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 how wearing, it's actually how we met. You know, well, I was. Uh, I was just, you know, sort of just walking past a house one day and I could hear a party and then suddenly Sam came flying out of the chimney uh, just in her pants and landed on top of me. And that, that's how we met. True yeah. story. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure everyone else has got very similar stories as well. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure. Sorry, I probably shouldn't have shared that because it's so common. It probably wasn't it's worth all, sharing. It's almost a bit mundane, isn't it? The VHS Film Club, I would say. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Sorry, I should actually come up with something a bit more original. <laughs> But actually, you did you did touch on something which I think is interesting. It seems to be very common in John Hughes films is computer hacking. Or actually, yeah. it seems to be a common thing in the eighties at that point, isn't it? You got you got computer hacking in this. You have got computer hacking in um, Ferris as well. And then if yeah. you just follow Roderick backwards, you know his breakthrough war games computer hacking. So it was a massive yeah. thing at the time. Um, I think it was seen as very cutting edge. I think because it was all the you know. The, the kind of birth of the internet and modems and connecting computers over vast distances. Yeah. So hacking yeah. seems to take a really big thing in films at this time, I think, and it did in this film as well. So they couldn't have made Lisa without hacking into the supercomputers yeah. to get the extra, the extra processing power. The, the okay. Thing, um, sorry. Um, no, the, the, the thing there with like sci-fi writing that that it went from. I think it started in the 50s. It may be a holdover from that as well. That it went the thing from aliens invading um, to sort of supercomputers, like a lot of people, like um, I say L. Ron Hubbard, but it's not who I'm thinking of, sort of thought that supercomputers would probably end up dominating the world. And there was a lot of writing around that. And, and I guess we're not too, that time is probably still not too far from that. So that, that there may be like a little bit of that as well. Um, of, of getting one over on the supercomputer before it takes over sort of thing. To, to be honest, I think AI is probably thinking we'll, we'll, we'll destroy ourselves anyway. They don't really need to intervene, to be honest. Yeah. So they're probably just like, why do we need to do anything? Let's just sit back and the humans will be gone soon. <laughs> just make sure they keep the power on. <laughs> um, okay. Um, it's going to the funny bits. This is a comedy. Um, there are so many good bits in in this film. Did you want to any bits you want to pick out? I've got a massive list of things I like in this film. The um, okay, the first one, and it makes me laugh every time. Um, referring to having a poo as dropping wolfbane. 
I don't try to do the toilet humour in this film. I think the bit where um, Deb and Hilly are knocking on the bathroom door to try and get in, yeah. and they, they ask, I think they ask Gary, like, what are you doing in there? And then White in the background shouts, Gary was just taking a shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you see his face, his eyes, like, wide, and he's like, oh, my God, don't say that. <laughs> There's really pretty girls outside. I love that bit. I love all the toilet humour. It really gets me. It is pretty... I mean, I think normally we're pretty sensible and we clearly aren't, you know, the sort of guys to revel in that sort of stuff. But, you know, that, that, that was <laughs> But that, that was great. I, I love every, um, the, the whole thing where they go to the blues bar um, is, is, is brilliant. They're, they're just trying to fit in. So, yeah, Brian. <laughs> so did you know, yeah, did any of them have like, you know, how's your relationship with your parents? And it, it's just great that the whole scene, that whole bit. It just makes me laugh every time. I love that. And I love that story where he talks about that um, that girl um, that ends up kicking him in the nuts type thing and yeah. sharing. But I think I think a bit that makes me laugh the most is I think there's a, there's a, there's a black guy. I think, he's, I think he's bold. I think he's bold. He's got a moustache. And he is so, like, incensed, you know, that that's it. She did what? And he's like, slams. <laughs> and for somebody that really, the whole thing makes me laugh by that whole story. Yeah. But yeah, I love them in the Blues Club, and um, yeah, they they really like nervous going in, and they just kind of by the end of the night, they're all drunk and stuff, and they're just you know people are people, and they're just fitting in. It's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else did I have in here? I think the bits with um, yeah, the bits with Chet, I think are brilliant. Yeah. All the way through Chet's haircut, his laugh, I think Chet is brilliant. There's a bit where he's trying to make Gary throw up. Um, where he starts talking about a, a greasy pork sandwich and a dirty ashtray. Oh, there we go. Alison says, I love the part. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> have oh, yeah, that's it. We're, um, we're Wyatt drives through the um, the uh, the red lights and stuff. Yeah, well, we need to have your math. That and that, perfect. Yeah, I love that bit. That's really good, too. Um, yeah, the bits with chat. Um, yeah, yeah, that bit with the greasy pork sandwich and the dirty ashtray, yeah. that was actually something Bill Paxton's dad said to him when he used to come home drunk. Yeah. So that was a bit ad lib, which was really, really cool. Um, what else was there with Chet? Just check the chat. There's, there's a bit where Lisa's explaining what's going on the morning after, and Lisa gets Chet's name deliberately wrong, which I really like. And the good thing about that scene as well, I think um, the cast are breaking character and they're laughing in the background as well, which I really like. I think um, Anthony Michael Hall and um, I think he, I think Deb is his, his kind of um, sweetheart. Um, are kind of um, cracking up. They're trying their best. They're looking down like they're like they're in school or something like that. So they're not seen. But that Chet monster, Chet monster is brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> right from the start. He really, they, they, I think it, the bit that makes me laugh the most actually is a bit where Gary and Wyatt come back and find Chet there, and he's like, "Hi, dudes," and he's kind of <laughs> looking at him. And they're just like, <laughs> and then I think there's. Um, you know, I think that, I think there's a bit of White talking to Lisa and saying, you know, we we, we can't have him like that. He'll ruin Christmas. <laughs> <Which I love. laughs> and and then I think there's a bit where everything when Lisa leaves and everything starts going back just before Wyatt's parents come back, there's a bit where Chet just turns back into a human, and you see the first thing he does is check to see that Lisa hasn't given him elephant balls, and you see him grab his crotch, so, and you see the look of relief on his face that he hasn't got like. You know, like enormous balls, which I think is brilliant. So I think, so I think Chet, Chet is amazing. I think he's one of the standout people in this. Um, what else do I really like? Oh, a um, bit where Lisa, uh, bit this kind of magic Lisa does, um, where she freezes um, um, Wyatt's grandparents yeah. and she puts them in the closet, and they look so happy. They're like. <laughs> She doesn't see anything wrong with it. I think that's a, I think that's a bit this funny. She's like, she's thinking, well, this is the best solution to the problem. I'll just freeze yeah. them in a happy state. But obviously, like Wyatt and Chet as well, are just absolutely horrified. But yeah. like, she leaves them there. Like they come back in the morning and they're still, they're still there. They're still, they're still it, like, it's like, looking really happy as well. It's so like psychotic like thinking, isn't it? It's just that psychotic. This is the best route to the solution. Uh, let's do that. <laughs> what else is going on? A bit with Chet as well, where um, I think it's after the first night out in the jazz club, um, Wyatt comes down and he's wearing um, 
Lisa's pants. I don't know how he's ended up wearing Lisa's pants. <laughs> like Chet is incensed by this cross dressing, yeah. thinks it's very, very wrong. And and he like um he like pulls off his own towel, he's just had a shower and said, Christ's sake, will you cover yourself? And he'll obviously reveal <laughs> he like got everything out of that point, Chet. He's got his bum out is dude, he's obviously better to be completely naked than to have yeah. women's underwear on, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was great, yeah. Okay. Well, Sam likes the bit in the lingerie department where yeah, there's a really old shop assistant, uh, and Lisa's kind of putting it through her paces to find stuff. And I think she asked her to find a, a bra in barbed wire. And you, <laughs> the shop assistant is like, "Give me a break!" <laughs> it's kind of like. <laughs> Um, what else is there? Oh, I really like the bit where Lisa picks up Gary uh, from his parents as well. Yeah. Where she, you know, she doesn't do it in a subtle way. She does, she pretty much does everything she can to kind of incense the parents and create a scene, which yeah. is pretty much, which results in that conversation where she reveals Gary's like spending most of his time in the bathroom tossing off to, to porno mags. And Gary absolutely, I think that's part of a lot of the comedy is like the reactions of Gary and why. Gary's like, yeah. Jesus Christ, I just said that yeah. to my parents. She ends up oh, so I really like that one, she, as well. Just like it, it's total genius. Yeah. Oh, do, do you know what another bit I really like is when they're in the shower just after they made her, and they're both just mm. standing behind her, and she just goes, "Showering's really fun, isn't it?" And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, "What's the other bit I liked? It was a bit where Gary and Wyatt decide when the mutant bikers come in, the best course of action is just to hide." Yeah. And um, I think uh, Lisa's trying to get them out, and um, and I think she's talking about being brave to to Gary type thing. And I think he's going; those are identical. <laughs> yeah, he's he's referring to brave as being an outdated concept, which I really like because when he just shuts the door, we'll let John Wayne hear you say that. <laughs> That's really cool. Okay, right, pretty much. If you haven't seen the film before, we've probably pretty much spoiled that for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, okay. Oh. So, Alison, yeah, really good point. You can't wait to explain. Can't wait for you to explain where your bras are. Well, to be honest, mm. Alison, we've done this since episode one. Um, so um, it's just so I'm not quite sure what you're getting at there. Really, this is just this is just what we do. I think it's just the way things are. You know, that's <laughs> it, really. no, yeah, absolutely right. So the reason we are wearing bras on our heads, so we're both at different points in the film. Actually, I think uh, I've got. <laughs> Oh, which ones? I think I think I'm Gary. I don't know. Well, who did you think you were, by the way? You, I don't know. You... Okay, I think I'm Gary. Yeah. I think I'm closer to Gary. I think in this... I think we're at different points in the film. I think I think you're in the bit um, guy where they actually make Lisa the first time. Yeah. And I think I'm kind of dressed for the party where they make the missile. But yeah. <laughs> so basically, just for those who don't know, um, when. Uh, Gary and Wyatt uh, make Lisa and then attempt to make another Lisa um, they uh, for some reason decide to wear bras on their heads which I think Gary reveals is ceremonial um, so we're, in honour of them um, we are wearing bras on our heads it makes so many things to like that it makes total sense doesn't it it makes total sense absolutely total sense um, so on to some interesting bits. Um, I mean, did you have any interesting bits you wanted to bring up about this film? Interesting facts. I've got some here, but I'm happy to. Um, I've got a couple. Um, the jacket worn by Kelly the Bright, sort of a trivia one, um, was sold for twenty five thousand um, dollars. It's pretty crazy. Um, there was that, you know, did, no, that's crazy. Because I happen to know that the Cadillac in that film, the pink Cadillac sold for 15,000. Really? So the jacket sold for more than the car. That's that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, th th there's a different, I mean, just on general um, sort of um, trivia thing. Uh, Shermerville, um, John Hughes sort of uses that a lot. Sherman High School, Shermerville. It appears in this film. It appears in Ferris Bueller as well. It's, it's just a thing... Um, that he does, it's just a personal thing, but somewhere there's something called Shermerville or Sherman High School. Yeah. Um, there was originally going to be someone else playing Lisa um, called Kelly Emberg, who I don't know, um, but she was replaced, like, like almost sort of last minute, and Kelly DeBrock sort of came in. Um, 
And it's kind of cool, because I couldn't imagine anyone else doing that. Although I think Vanessa Angel did a great job in the series, I couldn't imagine anyone else playing that role of Lisa, to be no. honest. It's, yeah, I couldn't see it. She was great. Um, Demi Moore, Robin Wright also auditioned for the part, um, but they um, they didn't get it. Kelly the Brock did. I think she was great. I, I don't know if it's because she was English or there was something about it, but but she really does make it um, what it is. Um, yeah, because her accent is genuine. I know because I know she grew. She, I know she was born in New York, but she, I think she grew up in the in, in London. Yeah. So that's yeah. why her accent's pretty good. It's not a Dick Van Dyke type accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I had one more. Oh, the exterior shot of the high school um, was also used in 16 Candles um, and Risky Business. Oh, Risky Business as well. Well, yeah, you do see those things. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, what did I have? Um, just, just on a personal note, um, Weird Science came up in the renewal of my wedding vows, um, um, where, where I said, you know, um, that if I if, if I wanted to make my perfect woman on a computer, you know, it would have turned out just like my wife. Um, so, um, so. I, Weird Science inspired that and my renewal of my wedding vows. Uh, John Hughes wrote the script in just two days, which is ridiculous. Um, it, considering how long, well, I don't know how long it takes you to write a book. It takes me at least a year. But yeah. <laughs> two days to write a script for a whole film. Um, what else? Um, I thought it was interesting as well that um, the, 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 the Gary and Wyatt, one of their key requirements for Lisa is that she was super smart, which I thought was quite cool. You know, yeah. obviously there were also physical attributes which were driven, you know, probably hormonally. But at the same time, you know, one of the key requirements was actually that she had to be super, super smart, which I thought was was an interesting twist. Um, <laughs> if you remember in Conan the Destroyer, uh, we had a bit of a dodgy kiss. I think um, in that film, uh, you had Arnie, who was in his was he late thirties? Yeah. And then the young, I can't remember her name now. The young female character was like fourteen. In the film and they had a kiss at the end of the film um this one that's not as bad as that so you've got elon mitchell smith was about 16 um when and he was kissing kelly the brock who was 25 which i think he went a bit too far actually i think he did um take advantage which i think i think he was very lucky not to have his hops removed by kelly the brock i think i think he did slip his tongue in that kiss i don't oh. think she was too impressed by that um well so, um Allegedly, Kelly LeBrock's character named Lisa was inspired by uh, one of the first Apple computers. Uh, I think one of the processor chips was called Lisa. I think there was, I think it was a bit of a history with early, um, early computers to do that. I think Commodore did something similar. They'd give their chips, you know, kind of names like that. But Lisa was, I think, was the one in uh, for for um, uh, Apple. Uh, what else was there? Um, well, that goodbye scene, which is really good. Where they say goodbye to Lisa. I really like that scene. Um, it's quite a moving scene to say goodbye to her. What's that again, sorry? No, no, I was just saying it's quite yeah. sad. It's sort of, um, it, it gives, because that, that's the thing, that, that film is really funny and everything, but there's a couple of really touching moments in it, <laughs> and, and that's definitely one of them. And um, she says, so all, all I wanted for you, I don't remember the exact line, but, but like, all she wanted was for them to, you know, discover life and, and not sort of be uptight and, um, yeah. and fall in love. And, and it's actually quite, like, when I watched it, that's quite moving. I didn't, didn't sort of expect that at the end of it. It is like really moving. Yes, it's not the tone of the film, is it? But yeah, apparently, apparently that moved John Hughes to tears as well yeah. during the filming of that, which I think is cool. Um, I think um, Kelly LeBrock described her character as Mary Poppins with breasts, which I can kind of see that analogy with Mary Poppins, although I think Judy Andrews might dispute that she has breasts, to be honest, but um, like I kind of get where uh, Kelly LeBrock was coming from. Um, I think actually there's a cleverness to this film as well because this film could be really, really seedy and it's not. Um, no. And I think it takes that line really well. And I think it really helps that actually Gary and White never actually sleep with Lisa. And I think if they did, it would completely ruin the film. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think he treaded, I think there was a really fine line to tread with this film. And I think they trod that line really, really well. Um, so I think hats off to John Hughes for that. Yeah. And then you know, the thing is, um, it seems to be a big John Hughes thing. We'll see in Ferris Bueller's are lots of fourth wall breaks. You know, I think uh, I think it's like bit, I think it's actually a bit where Chet says to Wyatt, "Next thing you know, you'll be wearing a bra on your head," and then Wyatt <laughs> looks to camera, <laughs> which we can do now. Yeah, you got bras on. 
Okay, so I think that's it for um, Weird Science. We'll come back in a minute um, once we've uh, stated the case for Ferris. Anyway, uh, we'll come back and decide what we're going to pick. But over to you, Guy. I think you were going to fly the flag. I'm uh, sorry, is it fly, fly the flag for Ferris Bueller? Um, too many Ferris Bueller. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Um, so again, directed by John Hughes. Um, yeah, I just got, he, he did a massive amount of films. I just wanted to like touch on that for a second. Um, so in the in the 80s, Mr. Mom, National Lampoons, uh, Savage Islands, I don't know, 16 Candles, The Breakfast Club, more National Lampoons, Weird Science, Pretty in Pink, First Beauty's Day Off, Some Kind of Wonderful, um, Planes, Trains and Automobiles, She's Having a Baby, The Great Outdoors, Uncle Buck, Another National Lampoons. That was like all in the 80s. That's like a crazy amount of stuff. And then we got into the 90s and he did Home Alone. And so he really, really wrote and directed like a crazy person. Um, apparently he wrote Ferris Bueller in six days. So it took him, you know, he really dragged his heels on that one. Um, I feel like an amateur. I yeah. You are. I feel like an amateur. Really, like six days, two days. So no. what, what was he thinking, you know, and and um, but apparently it was because he was really under pressure. There's going to be a writer's strike. Um, so oh. he sort of had to get it done. <laughs> and he said he his I mean, they must have trusted him implicitly because he, he went to the, the like, like financiers and said, I've got this idea about a guy that takes a day off school. And they said, well, <laughs> what do you know about it? And he said, it's just that at the moment. <laughs> I'll let you know, you know, and then he just sort of wrote the movie. Um, oh, can I kind of stop you there? Because it was a great quote I got, and it kind of it kind of sums me up as a writer as well, actually, and may, maybe to you to some extent as well. It was it, it, the quote was, "I know how the movie begins. I know how it ends. I don't ever know the rest." <laughs> and that's me writing a book. If you just if you just do copy, you know, sort of find replace movie with book, yeah. that's how yeah. I write a book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would say that, that you're probably a bit of a control freak knowing how it ends. No, I'm the same. I don't sort of go too much into writer land, but I've, I've tried planning and, and I tried it recently. Uh, I was sort of stuck and I thought I'm really going to plan something. And the more I plan, the worse it gets. He said, <laughs> go from the man with the bra on his head. <laughs> But you know, I said we were pantsers, but it's actually we're brasters, probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I normally wear this when I'm writing, anyway. You know, just to sort of get in the mood. But, um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So, so the plot of Ferris Bueller. Um, so basically, is this guy that he, he's a bit of a bit of the opposite to the guys in Weird Science? Is that he's pretty cool. He knows what's going on. Um, he decides. Hey, he doesn't want to go into school and do exams. Um, he's had enough of that. Um, and he sort of fakes illness to stay home from school. Um, his parents go out. He has quite a cool thing, <laughs> a sort of keyboard, which makes vomit and, and stomach noises to save him doing it. So anytime anyone phones, he's like, ah, oh, he presses the key and it, and it makes some horrendous noise. Um, and, and this sort of essentially leads him to play truant. Um, and they go to sort of Chicago and do all this crazy stuff. But the dean of the school, um, who's played by Jeffrey Jones, who, who I'm not going to go kind of go into. Um, anyone looking on the internet will see why, but um, I'll leave that one. But anyway, it was played by him. Um, it is sort of trying to track him down. Um, he's determined that this guy isn't, you know, you know, he's not sick. Um, and again, it's another the computer hacking thing they hack into the system and sort of change um all the dates to make it look like he's sort of there um they borrow his friend cameron they borrow his ferrari um which is a 250 gt spider really super expensive car and it wasn't actually really a ferrari in the film because it was worth sort of 200 dads, wasn't it um, it was his sort of pride and joy. I think at one point he, he says he, he hates his wife and he loves this car. Um, yeah. And then they sort of drive it to Chicago and sort of go on these crazy adventures um, while the Dean's trying to sort of catch them out. And um, his sister, I'll go into the car. 
asked in a minute, but um, she's determined to try and catch him out and, um, you know, yeah. get him in trouble. Um, but the British... She's on the same... Sorry? Yeah, she's, she's on the same... Um, she's almost on the same mission as Rooney, really, the head yeah. teacher. Yeah, exactly. And... Um, she, <laughs> but... Um, well, so gonna, yeah, so, so they take the car, but they quite brilliantly decide... You know, he says, well, my dad's going to find out the mileage because it's going to go up. That, that's what they try and do. They try and drive it backwards to reverse the mileage, but it obviously um, doesn't quite work. Um, there's some... So, all right, so, so let, let's just have a quick look at budget. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's 5.8 million um, and it grows 78 million. So it, it did... Um, you know, pretty well. Um, again, it was one of those age things. Um, Alan Ruck, who um, plays Cameron, is uh, nearly 30 in the film. <laughs> He's supposed to be 18. And I think Matthew Broderick um, was sort of similar. Um, sorry, this is just, I just need to adjust this. That's better. Um, yeah, he, he was sort of much older. The only person that, that wasn't, uh, was actually the correct age, was Maya Sarah, um, who was in fact 18, um, during the sort of making of the film. Um, I, I really sort of like, I, I don't know, I, I really liked it. Um, there's some great scenes in it. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the actors first. So, um, yes, yeah, so Matthew Broderick, probably most people know. Um, Maya Sarah, who, who plays Sloan Peterson's girlfriend, um, I think it was the second movie, the first one being Legend, um, with a very, very young Tom Cruise. They're both like similar age. Um, I think he was 16 or something when he did that. Um, she, she must be 17. Jennifer Grey, um, who's in um, Dirty Dancing. Um, and then there's a couple, um, Edie McClurg, who's the the secretary. She Again, she crops up. She's a comedian. Um, she crops up in lots of John Hughes films. Um, it's really, really sort of funny. She was in Planes, Trains and Automobiles. I don't know if you know that. Um, how well you know, sort of watched it loads as a kid. Um, but she's the car rental um, lady. It's like, gobble, gobble. Um, and um, she always sort of crops up in his films. Uh, actor called Ben Stein, um, who is the economics teacher. He gives the world's most boring speech. Um, and the trivia on this one is that um, I couldn't believe this, but he's actually a speechwriter for President Nixon. Um, so he knew all this stuff. And they said, can you just be really boring? And he completely improvised. He knew about economics and he improvised the whole speech um, and bored everyone to tears. And he sort of reprises that one in planes, trains and automobiles as well. Um, but I, th I thought that was great. Um, there's another guy who's a famous drummer. Where is he now? Um, I'll find him in a minute. Is it, is it um, Ed, Edson? Yeah. Alison mentioned Richard yeah. Edson. No, I remember the garage attendants. There's a black guy and there's there's there's, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a white guy as well. But I can't, I can't, I don't know which one that is, um, but I don't know much about him. Is he on your list? I don't know yeah. much about Richard Edson. If you know something about Alison, please post it because I don't know much about that guy. Yeah. Um, again, he's just sort of acted and load tons and tons of stuff. But yeah, he's a drummer. I'm trying to find the van that he's in. I wrote it down. I can't find it now. But I might. Um, I might come back to it. I mean, I mean, I mean, the other two that, that jumped at me where you try and find that was Charlie Sheen yeah. as the kind of druggy in the uh, in the police station that it gets the kind of gets smoochy with Jeannie at the end. It, uh, famous for loads of films. Obviously, famous for his dad as well, Martin Sheen. But yeah. famous for Hot Shots, Platoon. Um, and then Kirsty Swanson, I actually mistook her for someone else, but Kirsty Swanson, who is the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer, oh, she's okay. the girl in the economics class who explains where Ferris is, uh, where she oh, kind of yeah. convoluted my friend's friend told me to learn that. But she's 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 in it as well. So okay. uh, a bit of filling. Did I buy you enough time to find out who this person was? No. <laughs> 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 but thanks for that. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. Um, yeah, Charlie Sheen, apparently, he went really method. and He was only in that film, um, not for very long, but he didn't sleep for 48 hours um, so that he could look sort of really um, spaced out. And he, and he did a pretty good job. So he, he was genuinely on his last legs. 
um, and, yeah. and really sort of almost on the point of hallucinating from lack of sleep. Um, which you kind thought, of amazed he did it that way, actually. You'd have thought he probably just would have taken drugs. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would have probably been easier, wouldn't it? Um, um, so, so they go on this crazy adventure. There's a couple more um, uh, trivia things I really like. There's a parade and there's several workmen dancing um, during the music, and that is all real. Um, that That's not staged. They were actually just doing that, and, and he liked it so much that um, he just got them to sort of um, record it. Um, there's a sequel plan for it. It never quite came off, though. Um, so it was just sort of that film. Um, I, I don't know if there was um, they wanted to do a TV series as well, but um, it was a TV series. It looked rubbish, to be honest. Oh, um, was it? And I did say that Matthew Broderick wasn't keen on doing a sequel as well, but the TV's maybe different to Weird Science. I thought the TV show for Weird Science was good. I can't verify that. I've never seen it. But it didn't look good. I had a quick look, yeah. and it had that feel of being, you know, sort of like just trying to make money off the back of something else, and really didn't have any heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. It, it was kind of. I mean, there's, again, there's some nice. It, it's quite quirky. There's some really touching scenes in it, um, and and also really funny scenes. But I really like the scene where he's dancing and lip syncing to Twist and Shout um, in that parade. And that, to me, I thought that pretty much encapsulates being young. Um, I'm just going to do this, you know, and. Um, I, lo I love that scene. I just think it's really, really good. Um, some quite sort of poignant bits when Cameron, he's trying to reverse the Odometron. Obviously, this is major spoilers, so I will. Uh, oh, we do this all the time. We, we completely ruin That's why we try and do films that are 40 years old, because yeah. we're really bad at, at, at doing this. Well, we're really good at doing this, I should say. Spoilers, yeah, we are so really good at doing this. Um, but Cameron's trying to run this car backwards, run the odometer backwards. Uh, and in the end, he has this sort of break and, and he just goes, you know what, I, I just, uh, you know, his dad's really domineering. And um, he kicks the sort of chalk out from under the car and it kind of goes through the window. And um, yeah, again, it's it's really good. There's sort of little moments like that that are actually kind of incredibly sort of touching. Um, well, Alison, by the way, came in. He was he was the white guy of the two garage attendants. He was in some really big films, actually, Desperately Seeking Susan with Madonna. That's right. um, I don't know if it's in Paradise, to be honest. I don't remember that one. Platoon is obviously a massive film. Also, Charlie Sheen was in that one, amongst others. Good Morning Vietnam with Robin Williams as well. So a lot of big films. But, I, I, but yeah, I, I think I did, did vaguely recognise him, but not enough for me to chase up on what I might have seen him in before. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I just, um, I think, again, that scene really made me laugh. I, I, I researched him for that. Because he gives him the keys. He's sure this is going to be all right, and he's like, "Yeah, it'd be absolutely fine." And then the, the next scene, that they're just roaring off. <laughs> so, the best thing about that is that, um, he talks really slow. He almost talks like he's stoned, yeah. and he's like, he was, he's almost like looking. He doesn't seem like he's quite with it no. when he's sort of like talking to him. He wouldn't give you any confidence whatsoever, like giving those keys over to someone who looks pretty much part way stoned yeah yeah yeah, yeah. A absolutely yeah it, it would be and they say yeah it's fine it's up just don't even worry about it um uh, a, a couple more um trivia things um there's a scene where cameron gets pulled into the pool he sort of goes catatonic um and he thinks something's happened to this ferrari and um, they pull him in the pool, and, and when he's under the water, he sort of has this awakening. Um, but the pulling him into the pool was completely improvised. He wasn't expecting that to happen at all, um, which sort of adds to <laughs> the reality of the scene. Um, yeah, I like it. He, he's, I guess, Ferris Bueller, like as a character, is maybe less likable than the other guys because he's kind of, you know, he's going to sort of succeed. I liked his powers better. Yeah, it's uh, difficult. I, to be honest, I think the absolute star of that film is Jeffrey Jones. I think yeah. with that, pretty much most of the comedy, and is a comedy, comes from what happens with Ed Rooney trying to find... In fact, I noted down the funny bit, and pretty much every one involves Rooney. It's kind of like... It's the look on his face when, he can, when he's talking to... Um, Ferris's mum saying how often he's been absent and then you can see the numbers changing on the screen in front of him. That's absolutely brilliant. 
there's there's a bit where he kind of thinks he's talking to Ferris Bueller on the phone and giving him shit. Uh, and then Grace, who played that other brilliant comic actress who went from planes, trains, and automobiles, you know, interrupts him and says Ferris Bueller on line two. And he's like, he has that moment going, oh crap, I'm not talking to Ferris Bueller. And, he's just been, and he thinks he's been talking to Sloan Peterson's dad and giving him all this crap and telling him to roll up the, you know, yeah. sort of roll up with the, with the dead grandmother and stuff. But actually, I think she's the other person who's amazing in this, is her, because all the interactions between her and Rooney are amazing. I think. I think she says, like, uh, what's your language this time when you speak to us? <laughs> so, which is basically Cameron. It's not Sloane Peterson's dad. Um, yeah. And then I think Rooney's talking about it being a conspiracy and, you know, Sloane Peterson's involved. And I think um, Grace says, the grandmother too. He's obviously... Which <laughs> 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 is brilliant. Which is Rooney's, like, rolling his eyes like, yeah. at it. Um, there's a line about leaving my cheese in the wind, which I think is great, which was ad-libbed by Jeffrey Jones. Um, I love the bit when he flips his shades, like in with with the gumshoe detective music going, like he's really yeah. cool or something like that. And he flips his shades up, and I he's kind of got these glasses where you can have the shades pulled down on your normal. And I couldn't yeah. think of anything less cool than those. And he kind of flips them up. It's really cool. Um, when he mistakes that girl um, in the arcade for Ferris as well, I think that's brilliant. Yeah. And she yeah, 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 yeah. With a cape over him. Um, Rooney and the dog, the Rottweiler. Those bits are really, really good as well, I think. Um, and I think Bowie, he has to receive the flowers from the English department for Ferris as well, because he's still hanging around the house. Yeah. I think that's. I think. I think the delivery guy beeps the um, beeps the horn as he beeps the horn. Jeffrey Jones goes. Oh, the bit, and this is a brilliant bit of editing because I think it's only he only got kicked in the face once by Jeannie in the house. So he's, he's in the house, and Jeannie, who's Ferris's sister, thinks he's, obviously he's an intruder. And she, like, they kind of like jump out at each other thinking they're catching Ferris, yeah. and they both catch each other. And then Jeannie kind of has that fight or flight response and kicks Rooney in the face. Yeah. But they edited it, she only does it once, but they edited it so it was a repeated kick. So he gets kicked about three or four times in the face. <laughs> which is brilliant um and then it's a bit at the end where rooney's on the bus i love that bit yeah, as well yeah. where he's got you know because he's lost his wallet his car keys his car Shoes. and he can't go back there you go so sam's got a comment ferris is a less relatable character because he was just so cool and we just we just yeah. weren't that way well. and yeah i think she said yeah everyone loves an underdog but the guys in weird times i think I'm probably going to get too close into the meat of it, but actually, I think I'm going to have to lead off that. It's one of the reasons I love Weird Science more, I think. You know, in Weird Science, you've got two hormone driven teenage losers, um, and it's hard not to kind of relate to that, really, yeah. versus Ferris, who's just like super cool and there's nothing he can't handle. And yeah, I think yeah. that's it's much harder to relate to Ferris. He is the main character, like I said, I think. I think the film should have been, the film almost should have been called, rather than Ferris Bueller's Day Off, it should have been Ed Rooney's Day Out, because actually yeah. I think the the best bits of the film are probably the bits with Jeffrey Jones in. Yeah, yeah. Be, be. yeah. Yeah, I think, and also um, Alan Ruck, who plays Cameron as well, um, they, they're almost like, Ferris is sort of the vehicle for them in a way, because they've got the sort of meteor parts and like his sort of constant worry about his dad and taking this Ferrari out. And um, that that's sort of actually more interesting to watch. Whereas, you, like, like you say, you know, like Sam says, you know that Ferris is going to come off um, fine. He, he can handle anything. He gets them into that restaurant. You know, he, he can do all that sort of stuff. And there's no way in. There's almost like no way in <laughs> to sort of feel you think well yeah he's going to be fine you know uh, and yeah it's weird actually that that's kind of now i'm supposed to fly on the flag for the film but um <laughs> <laughs> you were like you're like to to mind that's fine but actually that's one bit i do I, one funny bit i think one of the few, one of the few funny bits i think that didn't necessarily involve ed rooney was the bit there's a line that ferris says to that maitre d who's really really snotty yeah with him doesn't want to let him in, doesn't believe he's Abe Frome and the Sausage yeah. King of Chicago or whatever. <laughs> and I think he says, understanding is what makes it possible for a person like me to tolerate a person like you. <laughs> Which absolutely, absolutely, he's like refusing to be beaten by this guy and slaps him really, really hard. Okay, well, Sam's saying, I agree, Cameron is a much more interesting character. 
Yeah, I agree. He's got he, he's got the depth in this film. I think yeah, every film has to have a, a level of depth. I guess. Well, um, he has the biggest arc because in the yeah. end we're sort of getting deep here. But his sort of character arc. Obviously, I can use things be, being a writer. You know, we we can bandy these words about. We know what we're talking about. Um, but he, he does because he's kind of like terrified through the whole film and he even gets into the state of catatonia where, where he's like um, they can't revive him and then um, he has this moment of awakening and eventually um, he ends up like smashing the floor <laughs> making it um, kicking the thing away so it goes through the window and he's sort of free so he's got the character up whereas Ferris is still the same at the end as he was at the beginning and he doesn't get through know, he's kind of very 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 one-dimensional there's no yeah. there's no journey for him it's interesting because usually the main character of a book would be the person who goes through that journey yeah. so it is it is it is interesting actually that it's uh, he, he, yeah it is interesting that he doesn't go through any anything particular from cameron's the one who goes through the the major journey during yeah. that film yeah 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 so I've tanked okay. it's my own argument now, but <laughs> um, but it's something, it's something I want to bring up, and it's not really um, it didn't come up in any of my research, but there's a bit where Rooney's trying to get into the house, um, and he steps in a soft bit of mud, yeah. you know, near the, the the garden hose type thing, and he, his foot goes in, and he manages to get his foot out in his shoe, and he cleans off his shoe with the hose, he turns the hose on, he doesn't turn the hose off, he just Leaves it running, sticks it in the ground. You yeah. think what unbelievable vandalism from a from you know who's someone who should be a pillar of the community. I mean, that's yeah. going to cause major structural problems for a house having a constant bit of running water, you know, just near the wall. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a real he's a real bad guy, isn't he? That's like you know, <laughs> sel seldom <laughs> you know, it, it's hardcore stuff. You know. actually, actually, there is a film he's in that I'd love to watch again. Maybe it'll be for a future film club. It's Howard the Duck. Uh, it was oh, a film yeah. that bombed. It was a Marvel character. Howard the Duck was a Marvel character, a bit quirky Marvel character. He wasn't like a Hulk or a Spider Man. Yeah. Um, it was. It was meant to be a bit comedic, but he was in. He was in that film, and it was a massive loss for George Lucas. It was a huge amount of money spent yeah. on the film. Leah Thompson was in it. I think she was the main character, apart from Howard the Duck. Yeah. Um, I'd like to go back and watch that again. He's also in Beetlejuice, which was a fantastic film. He's great in Beetlejuice as well. I'd love to go back and watch that, maybe in a some sort of superhero or kind of comic book um, episode of this. But Howard the Duck, I think definitely need to go back and check that out, I think. I, I he was in that film as well. But, but yeah, I, 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 that was a brilliant film. But yeah, it was a bit of a flop, wasn't it? I think they tried to remake yeah. it as well. I've got a feeling they tried it again. Um, I don't know if it was any more. But, but I liked it. I thought it was cool. Um, yeah, I, I love Howard the Duck. And actually, I was so cool when they did the Marvel Cinematic Universe to see Howard the Duck appear in the yeah. collector's collection. I thought it was cool. So Sam says, um, I wonder if I inspired the war to be left on by the robbers yeah. in Home Alone. Could have been. Yeah, Bandits. Yeah. Could have yeah. been completely. Um, anything else you wanted to, it seems as I've, I've probably talked you out of your, um, <laughs> your choice already. <laughs> Is there anything else you wanted to do? Anything interesting you also wanted to bring about the film? Um, there was some cool music in it. Um, oh, you did Oh, yeah, we... again. The, the song that bothered you in, <laughs> in um, Secret of My Successor. Uh, oh, um, yeah. That went uh, well, well, that is in it, yeah. And, and it, I watched it last night, and I watched it, and it bothered me just as much um, watching the video as it did the first time. But yeah, Ooh Yeah by Yellow is in it. Um, a ton of other stuff. Love Missile um, by Seek Seek Sputnik. Um, yeah. yeah, Dream of Genie. Beat City by the Flowerpot Men. Um, there's a little bit of Star Wars in it. Um, please, it please let me get what I want. Um, uh, Twist and Shout. Yeah, obviously, Radio People by Zap, I'm Afraid by Blue Room, Take the Day so Off by Jimmy Public. Some cool Alison mentions, mentions Twisted Shadows, one of her favorites, and it does fit in that really iconic scene on the float. And Sam yeah. says it's iconic as well. The, the, yeah, maybe, the, one, maybe the, one day we can recreate this. Maybe if we're in Brighton or somewhere the same day, there's some sort of thing going on, we can try and sneak onto a float and try and recreate that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It'll be, it'll be immense. Um, yeah, the, the score um, was really beautiful. There's a couple of really nice themes. Um, 
there's not much in the way of sort of music in it from like film school perspective but the ones that are in it by the composer Ira Newborn I don't particularly know but you know he's done a ton of films and and the music was really beautiful really really touching a bit like sort of a Ennio Morricone sort of vibe to it um and I love that yeah. so um lot, lots of cool music you know yeah I'm afraid um taking the day off by general public um the edge of forever march of the swivel heads and of course, oh yeah, I don't know much of the swivel heads, I have to say, but um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not on my playlist. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I kind of, I, I like the music to it. Um, yeah, I, I loved it. I, I kind of, um, I, I got into it, through, I, did, I did, I will admit, I got into it through the character of Cameron. Um, yeah. that, that, that sort He's of nailed it. Thing. He's relatable. He has a, he's he's hurting. He's struggling with his teenagers, yeah. and pretty much all of us did that. So it's um, yeah, he's much more relatable than than Ferris, to be honest. He's yeah. he's the kind of route into the film, really. Yeah. I think apart from the comedy, yeah. but you know, uh, Jeffrey Jones and um, person who played Grace, they're brilliant. They yeah. are absolutely brilliant. So I think um, like you mentioned, you know, um, the actors Edie, I think her name was, yeah. you know, how she was, where she's the, um, in planes, trains, and automobiles as well. She's amazing in that. Where yeah. Steve Martin really loses his loses his shit yeah. after um, he's sending a wild goose chase for his car, and after everything that's happened before, and she's just chatting away to a friend on the phone, yeah. making him wait, and he absolutely <laughs> loses it with her. And she's brilliant in that as well. She's an absolutely amazing actress as well. Yeah. Uh, she, she, she was great. She's, I mean, she's getting on a bit. She's still around now. Again, I think she's sort of in her eighties now. But, um, but it, it's like quite a skill to get. Like, she's only in that film a short bit. Yeah, I remember her performance in it. And the first thing she says to him when he walks is, uh, "Welcome to America." <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's good. Uh, Sam says, "Hey, answer." Sam says, "I can see why you went for bras rather than floats." Well, the thing is, it's a little bit harder. We'd have had to. You'd have to get a film crew, and it's not beyond our means. But again, it would have been a lot more. To be honest, I'm just lazy. To be honest, I can't be asked. Yeah. Um, it was easier just to just to put a bra on my head and just set up a camera phone. To be honest. Yeah. I mean, we do, we do want to relate to the people as well. We don't want to just seem aloof. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, plated cornflakes. Yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't make us famous, does it? So, anything else you want to do? Add to. Um, the Philip Bueller pitch. I, I, I think let's just have a look and see if I can sort of um, bring it back and, and make a good case. Um, well, I have a good go. I'll just go have a look and maybe go through a few things I noticed. Um, yeah. A bit with the clarinet, with um, the um, the Ferris plays that was improvised. So I think it was um, Matthew Broderick's idea. I think John Hughes was up for a bit of ad libbing, which is just as well because I know. With, with the Ed Rooney role was quite a small role and Jeffrey Jones actually made it. And it, I think without Jeffrey Jones's role, I don't think you've got the film you've got no. now. It wouldn't be a great film without Jeffrey Jones. And he made that and John Hughes let him ad lib all that stuff. So yeah. I think I think John Hughes has got to take a lot of credit for actually giving his actors the latitude to do those things. I know some yeah. directors famously don't allow that <laughs> to happen. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned that the Ferrari wasn't a real Ferrari because of cost. It was um, the MGs, I think, that had been uh, that had a fiberglass body on. Uh, what else was there? I think the original role of Cameron was offered to Emilio Estevez, which I think Alan Ruck was very appreciative that Emilio Estevez um, turned it down. I think he said to him <laughs> directly, thank you very much for turning down that film <laughs> so I could, I could do it. I think an interesting about Alan Ruck, I think he struggled. I think um, I think after this film, he moved to, to kind of or towards Hollywood to do more films. I think uh, I think he was set up to do a series that fell through, and nothing came. And he basically moved moved his whole family because he was obviously near his thirties. He had a family. Yeah. yeah. Um, he, had to, he had to work in a, a Sears, which is like a department store warehouse for a bit, I, just to make right. ends meet. So he actually got another kind of acting bit. Um, and I think he, he basically lied to his co-workers. He everyone sort of said, "Oh, you know, really like that Cameron in um, in um, in Ferris." And he was like, "Oh, yeah, really funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's not me." <laughs> he was too embarrassed to say what had happened. Uh, yeah, so that was yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what else? What else to have in my notes? Well, oh, the, the keyboard. Was... Oh, go on, then. go on, go on. 
Oh, no, no. I was just going to quit. Well, yeah, Jennifer Grey, that's right, yeah. So, um, she couldn't run fast enough um, but when she did the running out of the kitchen scene. Um, she couldn't physically run fast enough, and they ended up having to speed it up um, to make her run at the prerequisite pace. Um, <laughs> that was quite funny. Um, there's another one. Oh, I've just lost my notes. Hang on. Um, it's okay. I'll have to, why, why are you looking for that? There's another one I thought was quite cool as well. You know, that, that um, keyboard was real cutting edge tech yeah. at the time. Um, I think it was about, at the time, it was nearly two grand's worth of kit. Um, yeah. And actually, if Ferris had sold that second hand, he could have easily bought himself a car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's lamenting he's got this, this computer and this keyboard and all this stuff. And he had all this stuff that he could have basically sold to get exactly what he wanted yeah uh, which is thought it was quite funny did you manage to catch a place yeah the, the one i had was um there's a few well johnny depp was offered um Matthew broderick's role um but he turned it down and i think um someone else sort of fairly well known was as well but uh, again for, for matthew you know for that part i can't see anyone else doing it but him um yeah. it would just be weird I'm surprised to hear that because I think John, I think from John Hughes's perspective, I think Matthew Broderick was the person he wanted. But I guess the yeah. studio might have had different ideas about who yeah, they wanted. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, was, what else was there? Um, oh, the fact that um, they had to hand paint the, the leaves outside because it was meant to be in summer and it was yeah. actually autumn. So, so some poor special effects person had to paint all the leaves green. Yeah. <laughs> that must have been such an awful job. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, I think that's it, though. I think uh, I think um, I think we kind of had the debate on which film we'd like to rent in the middle. Um, but let's, yeah. I'm obviously, st I'm sticking with Weird Science. I don't know if we have managed to bring you over to the dark side and bring you to Weird Science or not, or whether you're still digging in and saying I want Ferris. Uh, I I I might have to come over to the underdog side. Actually, I, I love Ferris Bueller. Um, and I love the characters apart from him, um, but but the weird <laughs> side, it, it, it's always the the underdog sort of gets it because we have been underdogs, we know what it's like, um, and and I think just the teenage angst and sort of desperation of trying to fit in, um, and, and they do get there in the end. I, I think I will have to come to the dark side and vote for that as well. Okay, because like I said, we've only really got. You know, we've got a very limited amount of money budget for the video and further snacks, and maybe we'll try and get a full pack of, um, uh, I don't know what, <laughs> what tenants maybe? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> In the 80s. Um, and we got, oh, we got a vote for Weird Science from Sam. I'm really interested. Hope if Alison is still online, I'd love to know what Alison was voting for because she kept that close to her chest. Um, yeah, she did, yeah. Weird Science as well. Do you know, I'm very pleased to announce then that Guy and I are going to rent Weird Science. Um, I'm really pleased because the consensus on both Internet Movie Database and actually the box office was that Ferris is the better film. And I I disagree um, yeah. from for the reasons we previously cited about, you know, Ferris being a very unrelatable character, yeah. whereas, you know, two hormone-driven teenage boys is much more losers as well is much more relatable i think than uh, than than the other despite all the sci-fi elements to that okay so we're gonna we're gonna rent in science i'm really pleased about that yeah. i think uh very very pleased um we haven't talked about what we're going to do next i think we'll leave that as a surprise unless you had a suggestion um off the top of your head oh okay. oh um i don't know I, I i'd like to do um i'd like to do some action ones like maybe a romance in stone oh the oh adventure ones okay adventure ones okay so yeah adventure so i reckon all right then let's do this and let's let's do this on the fly so romancing the stone i think unless someone else comes in with something better i reckon it's a slightly different one because you could say it's in the same category as this yeah i reckon the goonies okay. is another adventure one romancing yeah, the yeah. stone versus the goonies i reckon and unless someone else, so unless someone else can come up with a better suggestion on this kind of adventure trope, um, we'll go for Romance in the Stone um, with Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas uh, versus The Goonies with Sean Astin and and the well, we could go on forever, couldn't we? That <laughs> people who are in that, yeah, uh, Corey Feldman and everyone else. Um, so 
but I think we'll probably should sign off. I've run out of wine for one thing, so that's mm. you know I could I could dehydrate if I don't if I don't leave uh, this area soon. Yeah. Uh, but thank you very much. I, I really appreciate um, you joining this, and I'm so pleased you wore a bra on your head. There was no coordination, I guarantee. I th honestly, God thought you were going to dress as Vernon Wells as the Mad Max biker. I, I, I was. I was just worried that I'd scare people you know I, i'm such a you know people see me and they're like oh geez what, what's that guy even thinking he's looking at me just don't look at him uh, and i thought well i don't want that for the viewers you know so, so i i softened up but it was a very close thing um you know i, I could do vernon maybe next time <laughs> well, we'll be, maybe if we do mad max 2 at some point you can uh <laughs> your, your options will be more limited i guess um yeah unless you get the road warrior Okay, all right, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Guy. Loads of fun as usual, and thank you loads. Um, I'm really pleased that um, we had Sam and Alison here. I think it might be Alison's yeah. first time, I think, to this. Um, so I hope you enjoyed, Alison. You'll come back next time um, for our adventure adventure next time. Excellent. All right. Oh, God. <laughs> Alison's going to send me some sausage and strong. strong. Oh, strong. Oh, strong. I like strong, though. The trouble is, it's, 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 you know, it's obviously quite acidic, so you, you can't, but I do like a bit of Strombo. Yeah, Ooh, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure about the fat content with the cider, but it'll probably be all right. I mean, how bad can it be? Well, it's all sugar. It's all sugar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right. Well, thanks all. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll sign off now and we'll see you next time. Um, without the bras, I think, next time, because I feel quite warm now. Yeah, yeah, my head's beginning to hurt now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cheers, buddy. Thanks, Guy. Yeah, bye. Thanks, all. Bye, Sam. Bye, Alison. Uh, uh, uh.